Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. We go first today to uh, GO17. This was a view yesterday, infrared satellite uh, data, about the three big systems that were pulling across the North Pacific and into the Northwest United States. And you can really just see, here's one, two, and three. But it's more important, I think, to see where kind of the conveyor of the moisture is leading to. And it's been targeting the Pacific Northwest here. And as that first system plowed through the Pacific Northwest yesterday, it did bring in a lot of precipitation, but it was really confined to coastal Oregon and Washington and, and very, very northern parts of California. Um, as it went over the mountains here, you notice that in the Columbia Basin and in the interior of Oregon, we weren't picking up much precipitation. And while it did add some snow here to the northern Rockies and parts of Idaho and Montana, uh, this, this was a, the type of system given its trajectory to not just load them up with snow. What it did do, though, was produce some fierce winds, and I'll show you those in a few minutes. But this is GO-16 now, the one that looks uh, right here over the United States, and you can see um, the powerful load that was forming here. But before I show you that, take a look at a couple other things. Dense fog across uh, South Carolina, you can see that very well here, also in this part of the Appalachian Mountains. And look, there's some of the leftover snow uh, in and around Lubbock, Texas, from the previous system. Now, when we start to get into talking about those winds, we better look at the upper levels of the atmosphere first. I think there's some really cool things we can learn together here today. Three short waves. Here's one, two, and then the third one is right over here that I want to illustrate. Now, the one that's in the middle here is actually already completely closed off. And so this will be our most mature cyclone of the three that I just talked about. There's an open wave here and an open wave here. And the jet stream winds are very strong, telling us that we're going to have excellent upper level support for the development of this low. One other point to, to make here, our subtropical jet stream joins us here. And we've had that be a consistent factor throughout this year and that uh, subtropical branch of the jet stream is pretty far to the south and to the east and it has not been coming from for example hawaii to california and that's something we've talked about quite a bit but take a look at the three different lows that were produced by that upper level flow pattern our most mature is this occluded low right here with the open wave behind it that low is still deepening and yesterday i mean just look at the winds that were screaming behind uh, the short wave that was coming here over the rocky mountains into southern saskatchewan I want to show you some neat stuff about this. First, we can go just look at the winds. This is um, for yesterday on the 13th, maximum hourly uh, averaged wind speed. So this doesn't include gusts, uh, but you can see here how strong the winds were in parts of the Pacific Northwest, Southern Alberta, Saskatchewan, and then into Montana. Uh, some places here easily going off my color bar, which I set at 60 miles an hour. We had some gusts here uh, at times that were approaching, um, you know, in the 70 to 80 mile an hour range. In fact, in Glasgow, which is right here, they hit, they hit 79 miles an hour in a gust. And it was interesting because when they went out to launch their weather balloon, uh, the guy that's uh, going to launch this year has got everything ready. The balloon is plenty full, goes outside and hits some of these 60 to 70 mile an hour winds, and it just shreds his balloon there. So here's attempt number two, and I'm going to thank the National Weather Service for showing us this. Let's the balloon go, and uh, the winds toss the instrument pack right back into the ground. Thankfully, those things are pretty durable, and this did collect some data as it went up and got us some critical information about this uh, winter storm here. But just take a look at where the nose of that jet was coming in just like this. Uh, this was last night, and then turned very quickly. You see, this is the kind of upper level dynamics we need. This, this wave into this area, the faster winds rounding the base of the trough to give us really good upper level support right in this area for the development of a cyclone. You can see it a little bit better when you look at the vorticity. So this is spin in the atmosphere. This is induced both by shear right here. This would be the change of wind speed uh, north-south. And then also you can see the curvature effect right in through here giving us a little vort max in this place. And as I've told you, it's you, you watch where the vorticity maxima are moving. And it was moving from here to here, right across this part of southern Saskatchewan. And that's exactly where our low pressure center was forming. And you can see the pressure gradient on the backside illustrating those very strong winds. Well, this process is going to continue as that jet noses its way over toward Minnesota. And that's why today our all hazards weather map has a broad sector of the United States with some sort of wind advisory, high wind watch, or high wind warning. We're going to see winter storm advisories, winter storm watches in this area as the low starts to wrap itself out uh, over Minnesota and Wisconsin. 
but it's going to change in its characteristic and it's going to go from an open wave to a closed wave. And I'm just going to play this forward 48 hours and stop it here on Friday night. What you see now is a much deeper low that is sitting right here over basically over Illinois. And what's going to happen as a result of that is this whole wave is going to become vertically stacked. And all I mean by that is that the upper level low is going to sit right on top of the surface low. And as it does so, it's just going to sit there and spin for a couple of days, but it's going to weaken with time, which is important. But I'll tell you this, as this takes shape, and I'm going backward here, I want to watch out here. Now, this is getting into this evening, so Thursday evening. Right here, as this ribbon of vorticity is pushed into this region, we could get some really good snows out of this. So just watch it again. Right here into this area is where we're going to be advecting that vorticity, giving us the best chance of some snow. Let me show it to you in the high resolution NAM model. Let's get this playing. We'll pause it right here early this morning. So the wave is still moving in this direction out of Saskatchewan over into Manitoba. And you can see out ahead of it, the precipitation could be a bit mixed in this area uh, along the leading edge of the, of the main front. But as we work our way through middle of the day today on Thursday, it's cold enough for snow across a broad sector here from Manitoba to the eastern Dakotas, uh, Minnesota, and, and Iowa. And out ahead of it, just a little bit of mixed precip moving through southern Wisconsin. By mid-afternoon, though, the low is now taking shape right here, you know, over Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin. And you can see the snow on the backside, but with some very strong winds in place here. And this low, just watch, it's just going to sit there and spin. Did you see it even retrograded? So it's here on Thursday night, 10 p.m. And then by the time we get into Friday morning, it's actually pushed back over, you know, maybe over here toward like Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And then it slowly just drifts southward and sets up over Illinois. And tomorrow afternoon on Friday, I want to illustrate something really cool here. See how the NAM model's picking up on these bright blue blotches? This is actually where the upper level wave is sitting right over very cold air in the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere, excuse me. And as a result, we're going to have good halfway decent lapse rates. And that just means the temperature is going to cool rapidly inside of that wave. We could get little convective snow bursts out of here. And you've seen this before. This is where we end up getting summer-like clouds, cumulus clouds, that then pop out with some big time snow for just a little while on Friday afternoon. But watch me just play the rest of us. That low just slowly spins its way over into the, you know, the eastern corn belt here in the Ohio River Valley finally pushing its main leading wave. This is an upper level front, by the way, into parts of um, you know Eastern Ontario, uh, getting into New York and so on. And so this is gonna sit here for the beginning of the weekend as well. Total snow from the NAM model. Remember where I told you that the advection of that vorticity was gonna be strongest right in through here? That's where we get up here above my four inch mark. Now I do a little different color bar. My grays stop at four inches, but even some of those little convective bursts down here could put down some locally heavier snowfall but the biggest i think is going to be right in here so you know think south of minneapolis i think is going to be where we're going to watch out for the most of this to see what happens after that let's go to the high resolution model and we're going to play through where we've already seen so let's stop it here saturday morning there's the low finally weakening but moving on off to the north and east after this those waves i showed you out in the pacific they're going to manifest themselves as these little clipper systems that come out of Alberta and Saskatchewan kind of clip down like this. And there is going to be another system on watch for you down here in Texas, but let's get to those. So first system is out by Saturday night into Sunday morning. It's pushing on off to the north and east. Could get some lake effect snow, but look, we still have on the backside of this some chances for snow throughout Sunday morning. As we go forward here into, this is now Monday morning. Monday afternoon and evening, there goes the next of those little clipper systems, quite weak here, while higher pressure sits over parts of the south and east. Now that system moves through Monday night into Tuesday, manifests itself right here over this part of Ontario. And we can see that around this high pressure cell, we're starting to pump in some moisture here from Texas to Louisiana and Arkansas. Meanwhile, our next clipper is coming out of parts of Alberta. This is Tuesday night. Going into the day on Wednesday, there it is. There's our next clipper. See some scattered snow here. And look at the moisture getting pulled back into this part of Texas, uh, parts of Oklahoma, but Arkansas getting over to Mississippi. So looking out to next Wednesday afternoon and then getting into the overnight hours, there's the moisture flowing around the high. Here's the next clipper running along the U.S.-Canada border. And we pull this all the way through out to next Friday. And you can see that seems to be the, the broad setup just continuing its way through the end of next week. 
There is a signal change for week two, and I'm going to talk for this, uh, especially about this for California here in just a few moments. But let's put a few things together here. Just over the next week, how much more wind are we going to be dealing with here? Well, this is maximum accumulated wind gusts measured in miles per hour. So we're still very windy here in southern Saskatchewan, but all along the Great Plains nosing into the Midwest here, we're going to have very strong winds uh, today. So you can expect to have some of these wind gusts here in the 50 to 70 mile an hour range once again today. Now, with the next few systems coming through, so the first one here pulling into the northeast, the next few clippers that slide down like this and then around that high, bringing in the heavier rainfall into this region, you can see what we're picking up here. Notice down here along the Gulf Coast, Central Plains, California is still continuing dry and it's actually a very dry week overall for the Pacific Northwest. Total snowfall through the next week. Now remember, this is combining uh, three different systems right in through here. Uh, but we, we do have the potential for picking up, you know, at least four to six inches of snowfall in some places, quite a bit more right in this area. And the same thing for these next few systems coming through this part of Canada, some, some bigger snowfall amounts here. But notice the west, not much being picked up here in the Sierra Nevada, getting into the Cascades or the Northern Rockies moving forward. And in the northeast, we can also see some heavier snows in the interior in this area, stretching back down into the Appalachian Mountains. But this is what I wanted to get to. This is where the pattern is going to be sitting by the time we get to a week from now. So, so basically looking at next Thursday. And what I want you to notice is the ridge that's in place here and the troughs in the west. Now this would be a week from now and we're going to pay attention to some sort of a sense of a development of a southeastern ridge. Now going from 7 days out to 10 days out. You can see now that this whole pattern has a bit of a retrograde to it. It's moving back to the west, and there's our ridge over the southeast. This was day 10. Here's day 15. So now the ridge is here. There's the trough. You can see the, the southwest, or excuse me, the southeastern ridge opens up. So if I just kind of go back here, it looks as though it's moving forward, but I'm going backward in time. <laughs> so this is the real progression of things. And this pattern here is going to change the flow across the western part of the United States. And it's going to be a major shift over what we had been seeing for the last month. You see where that ridge is building in here over the Aleutian Islands, we have had a lot of troughs. And that's signaling a pretty significant pattern change as we finish the month of January and get into uh, February. So notice where we've been having our moisture coming in here into British Columbia, it's now dry. We're wetter farther to the south, and if this signal holds true, we're going to have to watch this carefully. Week two showing up wetter for the four corner states in California is desperately needed. And we are expecting to see a relatively active track uh, uh, through Mid-South, uh, Ohio River Valley, that Tennessee Valley, this area for our storm systems going into the final week of January. Now, what about those temperatures? Well, this first map shows you the effect of the downslope winds coming off the Rocky Mountains. This was yesterday's temperatures mid-afternoon. If I get rid of my drawings there, you can see we had a broad sector here in the high plains getting into the central plains where our temperatures were well, well above 50 degrees, some places much warmer than that in the 60s. That's what happens when the wind goes over the mountains, compresses as it's downslope in this area. Well, what are we expecting today on Thursday? Well, that warmer air advects or moves a bit farther to the east. But remember, in these maps, the colors tell you the anomalies. The numbers tell you the, the actual highs. A warm one today for California, too, as you see. Let's play this forward and see how things transition into Friday. So here's Friday's high temperatures and departure from normal. Getting into Saturday and Sunday and Monday of next week. What you're going to notice, I think this is probably the most important thing here, is that overall, except for possibly here, you know, in the Southern Plains, we just don't deviate too far from normal, one, and two, you certainly don't see any major cold air coming in, not only for the next five to six days, but even if we go out there to about day 10. But beyond day 10, the pattern begins to change, and it's changing first in the Pacific Northwest. So we do favor more mild conditions as we work our way toward the end of the month of January. But as the end of January arrives, this is where the pattern really changes as that ridge retrogrades back to the uh, Lucian Islands, and the troughs become established across Western North America. And what you end up getting here is a much, much different pattern. Now I'm going out and I'm going to look for some support in this pattern. We can start in the tropics. 
the MJO has really just, a, it's not been a strong signal. I think La Nina's dominated it. It's been hanging out here in null space for a while, kind of poked its head out into phase three, and it seems to want to come back over here, either into phase six or seven. Now for January, phase six does introduce some colder air there. And if we do make it over into phase seven, that would allow this to push farther to the southeast. In other words, it would be supportive. The, 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 the energy and momentum transport out of the tropics would be supportive of that pattern I just mentioned to you. We also have another factor here. We've been talking about the displacement due to this ridge in the stratosphere of our polar vortex being broken up into two separate pieces. 10 days from now, they're going to kind of orbit a bit. And so you can see we move one of those pieces over toward Europe and the other one over here toward this part of Russia. But the longer range models indicate that we're going to regain a bit of strength in the polar vortex. But we have set it off on a wobble here. And I think it's going to be something we're going to contend with for quite some time. So we put all that together and look at the latest data out for week three. So this would take us through the beginning of February. And the models continue to keep the coldest air here, some idea of some sort of southeastern ridge. And in between the two, the active storm track will kind of be in like this. So that's why we see wetter conditions here and wetter conditions here. And I don't, don't look at that area and think it's going to be dry. This is what the latest week three is suggesting. And I'm going to make one final uh, case in point here. Our La Nina is still pushing hard here, but we're starting to see a warming trend happening with the ocean temperatures back over towards South America. With this La Nina making these last big push over the next couple of weeks uh, of the trade winds in this area, we could start to watch the La Nina fade moving into the remainder of winter. And that's going to be critical in, in, in getting an idea on what this pattern is going to do uh, moving forward. So we'll leave it at that and we'll keep you updated, right? Look forward to talking again on Monday. Until then, have a great rest of your week. Thank you.